All right, so there's a couple different types of, of trademarks, symbols that you'll see. First is the R circle. This is a federally registered trademark. It means that you register your trademark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. A lawyer there has basically reviewed your mark of trade um, after your application. They've looked to see that it doesn't infringe on other trademarks in that particular product market. And then that mark is pub what's done, what's called published for opposition, which means that it's, it's published and then anybody who may be using that trademark, or I don't know how they know, um, could go and um, you know, oppose that trademark. Say, well, I've been using that trademark in that marketplace for 10 years. Like, screw you, um, you, know, you, can't, you can't have that. Um, it is a felony, a federal crime, to put um, an R circle trademark, a federally registered trademark symbol next to your brand name, logo, or catchphrase unless it has been registered with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. The other type of symbol you see, and you probably see this a lot, is the TM symbol. Um, this is a common law trademark. Anybody can have this. Say you have an idea for a boutique clothing company and you come up with a name, you come up with a logo, you come up with a catchphrase, whatever it is. Put a TM next to it and start using it in commerce and you'll have a trademark on that. Now, that trademark is typically considered a regional trademark, meaning Andre's dispensaries, I would have a monopoly in Lane County, but someone could start Andre's dispensaries because it's like a you know, really dope name uh, in Portland, right? Or in Maine or any, anything, anything like that. Now, the thing about a regional trademark or common law trademark is if you grow that name to become like super popular, say I start franchising and I decide, you know, not to register with the federal government, maybe they won't let me because of the business. Um, and, uh, you know, I start franchising in states where I can and, um, you know, I start to have businesses in Colorado and Washington and Maine, you know, all, all these places. And, uh, you know, I could maybe have an, a, a large monopoly just based upon that fact. Now, if your business is online, it's really hard to determine what a regional monopoly would be. But if you start like something like a dance school or a restaurant, and, you know, like you may want to just put a TM next to it, just so someone doesn't bite your shit. It's just letting them know, like, yo, like, this is my trademark. I know, I know what time it is. Like, I know a little bit about this stuff. I'm trying to protect my stuff. You know, piss off. Um, you know, kind of let, let people know what the, what the deal is and that you about your business. So, again, if you're going to start a little company, a little startup, a little media production company, a, you know, a, a recording studio, whatever it is, you know, when you come up with a name, put a TM next to it. And you, as long as you're using it, you can establish like a very valuable trademark. Like most of the Major League Baseball teams, the Red Sox, the uh, Blue Jays, uh, the Cardinals, most of them, uh, if you ever watch ESPN highlights, which maybe we'll have highlights some, some, sometime, um, and you'll look, they'll bring up like the logos or the names, and it will have a TM next to it. It's because a lot of those organizations and franchises have used those names for a long time and have an established common law trademark, which bars any other major league or baseball team from, you know, oh, we're going to be, you know, oh, so here's a startup new franchise in New Orleans for baseball. We're going to call ourselves the Red Sox. Like, you, could, you couldn't do that. Um, and obviously, Major League Baseball thinks it's good branding um, to allow little leagues uh, to use, you know, their names, you know, uh, it's just good, good marketing and, and branding. Um, but anyways, this is typically though geographically restricted, but if you have online business, a large business that's, you know, franchised around, um, around the country or around the world, you don't need to register your mark. But if you register your mark, it gives you like a little added, you know, mm. you know, of protection. You may also see what's called an SM, a service mark. This is for companies that provide particularly just a service. They don't actually have any goods. Uh, UPS. Yeah, UPS has a store where you can go and buy cards and packing and stuff like that. But UPS delivers packages. It's a service. 
Comcast Xfinity. Xfinity is, you know, a service provided by Comcast. You don't actually buy anything. When you go and get your oil changed at Lubit USA or Oil Can Henry's, right? They don't actually sell you goods. Um, I mean, yeah, oil filters and stuff like that, but they sell, you're paying primarily for the service. So some businesses that are service-based um, will we'll just opt for putting an SM next to their name. Um, you can also register for your, um, your trademarks in the, in the state. So uh, you could give you a monopoly in the state. So say I wanted to franchise Andre's dispensaries in Oregon, um, I could do that. Um, you know, I would register my name um, with the state government and, and, and there's a slide later that has, you know, links to application and searches for, for names and stuff like that. Um, and that would give me a statewide monopoly in that product market, okay? Um, so how do you lose your mark? How do you lose your mark, okay? Really, this is super important. It is up for you, to you as the owner to protect your brand equity, your brand value. It is up to you as the owner to shut down counterfeits, to shut down knockoffs, to shut down any goods that may be confusing to confu uh, consumers. This is why the University of Oregon will have people in the Autzen parking lot uh, shutting down t-shirt and other types of sales. It's not to be haters, okay? It's not, not to be corporate, really, it's the fact that the more you let people knock off your trademark and put it on goods or whatever, all right, the less, the less power your mark has. And you could also lose your trademark by letting people do that. So it's up to you to police your mark. You have to police your brand equity. So you need to, uh, if you start a startup and you use your name, you know, this name, and then you find like, Four years later, someone, you know, does like a startup company, clothing company, and uses like a similar name, like you got to shut them down. If you don't and you let them keep using that name, it will devalue your trademark to the point where it becomes a generic term and you lose your mark, okay? So you got to protect your value of your brand. So the three ways that you can lose your trademark. First off is abandonment. If you have a trademark you've registered with the federal government or haven't, just have, you know, you use it as a common law trademark, three years of non-use means it's abandoned. After those three years of non-use, your trademark becomes public domain and anybody can use it for anything that they want. The next uh, way of losing your trademark is, and this is not as hot and sexy as it sounds, it's, it's naked licensing, okay? Uh, uh, or improper licensing, naked licensing. An example uh, of this is, is this. Basically, it means that you have licensed your brand name, logo, catchphrase, whatever, to a manufacturer, a manufacturer to make goods or provide services with that brand name, and they, l they are of poor quality. Um, and then you can lose your, your, your uh, license. So... Um, the University of Oregon requires all licensees, that's anybody who wants to put, you know, go ducks on t-shirts or calendars or anything like that, requires them to, once they have paid their upfront fee, it requires them to provide a sample. Because again, like if you buy University of Oregon uh, toothbrush manufactured by Oral-B and all of the uh, bristles fall out in your mouth and your gums start bleeding after a week, right, uh, then they are going to, the, the consumer is going to associate that lack of quality with the University of Oregon. It's just one particular example in terms of like, they need to police goods uh, or services bearing their brand name or logos or whatever for quality, uh, you know, quality con uh, inconsistencies. So another example would be McDonald's. McDonald's is a franchise. So if I want to start a McDonald's here, I need to become a franchisee. I basically pay for making a McDonald's, um, which may be subsidized or not by the company, 
and I'm licensing the right to use their brand names, their, their logos, the Golden Arches. I'm uh, able to use Big Mac, which is a trademark, whatever. I'm a franchisee. And part of what McDonald's corporate must do is it must go to all the franchisees and make sure that at some point they're inspecting their work, that their burgers um, are made to spec, that the quality is consistent, you know, et cetera. This is also, you know, you've seen naked licensing in like um, vineyards where like a famous vineyard will license its name to a startup vineyard across the country and then they do not check on the quality of the wine being made and they could lose their trademark. The last way you can lose your, uh, your trademark uh, is public domain, is genericization. Genericization is, again, when, um, you know, uh, you use the word zipper, which was once a unique, distinct uh, brand name to describe a zipping mechanism for clothing, okay? Or when you use Google, go Google it, or Google as a verb, uh, Google could lose their trademark on Google. Yo-Yo was once a um, trademark name, and you've had things like aspirin as well. Uh, Xerox had to fight to keep its uh, brand name because people would call photocopying Xeroxing. Okay, that's bad. Uh, you know, another example uh, would be, oh, you need a Band-Aid. Well, it's actually Band-Aid brand bandages. Uh, so Band-Aid had to fight for that. Kleenex. That's a brand name. It's Kleenex brand tissues. So again, they had to fight for they had to fight for that. Okay, um, but the important thing is, is as long as you use your trademark in the marketplace, as long as you are using it, and if it's registered, as long as you're paying your fees. If it's unregistered, it's common law. As long as you're using it, you have a trademark on that, which means it could last forever, 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 forever. Okay. Um, the other important thing to note is that trademark is subject to territoriality, which basically means that uh, you need to register for the trademark in every region or country in which you would like to exploit that mark. If uh, I decide to expand my dispensary franchise to Canada and someone in Canada has already re you know, registered a trademark for Andre's dispensaries, I cannot open under that name in Canada. So, um, you know, so it's, you have to register in every product, in every market or every country in which you think you'll be able to sell your goods or services under that brand, under that brand name. Some countries you may be like, yeah, like, you know, maybe people won't be like buying my, my gear in, in Bangladesh or people won't be copying my stuff in Greenland. You know, maybe I can bail on, on registering there. There is something called the Madrid, Madrid Proto Protocol. It's basically, um, it's a one-stop shop, so you can uh, submit an application there and it will try to register your trademark in all of the countries. I believe there's 84, maybe more now, that have entered into it. And, and basically, if um, you know, that trademark is available in that country, in that product market, you'll be able to register for, for a trademark in that country.